Welcome, friends, to this uh, monthly gathering we have of seekers of the spiritual path. And these are seekers who are not seeking anything from this world, but are seeking something which is belonging to their true home. Our true home, from where we came, where we are immortal, where there is no birth and death, and where we reside in our true form, is not here. It's not here because we don't see it. It's not here because we don't experience it. We only experience a created world outside of ourselves. Fortunately for us, the way to the true home is not outside. It's inside ourselves. The reason for that is that our true form our true essence is not physical, it's not even sensory, it is not even mental, it is not even thought, it is consciousness itself, that which creates life in its initial form. Consciousness which makes everything available to us through awareness, that's our true form. And since consciousness operates at any time, in any form that we have, from inside the form we have taken. Therefore, the way to our true home is also within ourselves. Even simple thinking tells us that we think from inside our head, speak from the mouth, hear from the ears, use this body to use that consciousness, whatever it is, whether you call it life or you call it awareness or Whatever name you give it, or you call it a soul, or spiritual, or spirit, doesn't matter what name you give it, it is still operating from inside us, not outside. And that is why it's a very good, fortunate thing for us that the true home to which we belong, although it is not visible to us here, happens to be here right inside our own physical bodies, right inside any form that we are taking. If we happen to be an insect, it will be inside the insect. If it will be a bird, it will be inside the bird. If it's an angel, it will be inside the angel. If it's any kind of form, or even formless, it will be inside that formless. So this whole secret, the most valuable secret on the spiritual path, that whatever you want to really discover is inside you, is very valuable to us, because that way, all our pilgrimages, all our running to different conferences, including this one, <laughs> running to different talks, different reading books, going to libraries, is all getting information, but is not the route, not the way to go to our true home. After reading all that, after all pilgrimages, after all the meetings you can attend, the net result will be, it will all be, the information will tell you, it's inside you. So when we say inside ourselves, what does it mean? When we say it is inside our body, and I have read several scriptures, they all describe it, that it's inside the body of a human being. Then where is it inside the human body? Where is consciousness operating from? Inside the human body. Is it operating from the entire body? Or is it operating from some central point in the body? When we examine that by introspection, by trying to look at our own body and saying, am I operating all my conscious activities from my hands? No. From my feet and legs? No. From my torso? No. From my head? Yes. Am I looking out through my eyes because the eyes are close to the head? Yes. Are the ears close to the head? Yes. Is the mouth I speak close to the head? Yes. Is it uh, somewhere else in the body? No. This is, does not take very long to come to a conclusion that what we are searching for is in a limited area. And if we want to narrow that down further, where am I thinking from? Not operating outside in the world. Where am I operating inside myself? Where are my thoughts coming? To see that, 
we look at the thought. Something we mostly have never been taught how to do. We have never been taught, we have been taught how to look at pictures outside, books outside, scenes outside, people outside. Never taught how to look at our own thoughts inside. But we can look at them. How? By putting our attention on the thought. Because when we look outside, we also look by putting attention outside. So if we have to look inside, we should also look with the same power of attention. So in order to look inside our own head, our physical head, where thoughts are taking place, simple way would be close your eyes so that you don't see outside, don't get distracted. Close your eyes and see your thoughts. Now thoughts are in two forms. They speak language, words, the language we have been taught. And many of our thoughts are taking place in that same language, which we learned. So long as the thoughts are speaking in us, and I, I want to tell you good news, they are always speaking. So you don't have to wait for them to speak. Thoughts speak continuously, without fear. If they stop speaking, we will die. That is why, just like this, a heart must beat all the time. If the heart stops, we die. If thoughts stop speaking, that means they stop thinking, we die. Therefore, they are always thinking 24-7. So no problem in listening to them. The second form the thoughts take is visualization. Make pictures. And thoughts come and we imagine things and we can see them. Very often, the two are connected. Sometimes they are not connected. But most of the time, when we think of something in words, we make pictures similar to what we are thinking. So we can watch our thoughts two ways. We can watch our thoughts by listening to them, and we can watch our thoughts by looking at what they are imagining. That's a beautiful experience if you try it. If you try to, the, to be one who is going to watch the thoughts, and one who is going to see the thoughts in pictures, obviously you will realize you are neither the thoughts nor the picture you are seeing. You are the one looking at them. This exercise is so vital and important because that's the first time you will realize you are neither thoughts nor the images that you see. Otherwise, we are always thinking we are thoughts, that we are the self is speaking in the thought. If you could separate yourself to see who is speaking, you will see the mind that thinks and speaks is not yourself, that you are separate from the mind. That's a great experience because otherwise, we never differentiate between ourselves and our thoughts. And we get so immersed in the thoughts. I am thinking, I am thinking. We always say, I am thinking. Nobody ever says, I am aware of my mind that I make it think in this way. I am using my mind to think. Which is the truth. The truth is, I can never think. The self can never think. Self does not need to think. Self is pure consciousness. It is the ability to be aware. It can be aware that it can create a mind that can think and use it, which we are doing very well. In fact, we are overdoing it. We are overdoing the use of the mind and not doing it the way it was designed to be used. The mind was designed to have the capacity to create a situation in which it can think. Thoughts in language require time and space. Without time and space, you cannot have any thought. If you take away all the time, thoughts stop. Take away all the space, get to zero space, all thoughts stop. Thoughts require both time and space. Now I'm giving you some good news. You can examine them. That is the thoughts that create time and space. And that not space and time was existing and we just went into it to think. We use the mind given to consciousness, created by consciousness, in order to create time and space and then make use of thoughts and time and space. Thoughts was great to be able to think and able to use, learn languages, to be able to communicate with people, communicate with yourself to talk to yourself, talk to others, talk to God, talk to anything. Talk to anything, including your own consciousness. That ability to talk to yourself was great. So therefore, 
the mind was a very useful thing given to us to talk whatever we wanted to talk but that's not what's happening we are not using the mind to think what we want to think we are listening to thoughts and listening and doing things what the thoughts are telling us we have made the mind our own master whereas we are supposed to be the master using some instrument given to us like the mind is like a computer if you start following the computer randomly bizarre giving information you will run into a mess and we have run into a mess because we have been using the mind to give us orders what to do instead of our telling the mind what we want to think from our awareness supposing we call our awareness or our individual self as it existed in a true home without time and space and without mind let's call it a soul that's a good word to use for it that's most of the time when we use the word soul and mind we are referring to that the unit of consciousness that exists prior to there being a mind or space or time is called the soul in immortality because the immortality comes automatically when there is no time and space it's not that you have to be immortal to go somewhere you remove time and space you become immortal if you are still there and you are there now all these things that i'm going to share with you are discoverable by you each one of you so long as you are a seeker of that which i'm talking about you are a seeker of your soul you'll find it because that is prime cause of all experiences if you have no awareness no consciousness nothing will be known to you so if you are conscious and aware you will find out everything so if your intention is if you are seeking is to find your own self your own soul you will find it now what i am only saying now is that when you are able to sit with your eyes closed with no distraction from outside and watch your thoughts hear your thoughts what is the mind thinking you are not telling the mind what to think just listen the mind won't stop thinking whether you want it or not therefore it's easy to sit behind the eyes and listen what is the thought saying you will be quite shocked what it is saying because you never did the separation so long as you identify with the thoughts identify with the mind you will never know who is the master and who is the slave you become the slave of your mind because you don't distinguish between the two now when you do that exercise you find that the power of consciousness is so strong and not only it can create a mind that in turn can create space and time it can go further and through the very process of awareness coming from our own total conscious self soul it can also generate events it can generate happenings outside of our body outside of our mind it can when you create space you create outside of yourself when you create time you create outside of yourself when you create space and time you can create infinite space and time because there is no sense of creating a time which has a beginning and a middle and an end because then the question will be what was before the beginning the moment you create time the concept of time as we are experiencing now the moment you create it you cannot create it for a finite time it has to be infinite the very notion of time flowing is an infinite time which has no beginning because the moment you put a beginning on time the question immediately arises what was there before the beginning and you can't answer that question it will more time it's always time similarly space space the moment you create space it is infinite space there cannot be an end of space you can go further to the limit of space what is beyond that more space the mind will never understand anything that exists beyond the limits of time and space and that is why what a great power of the consciousness to generate a mind that can generate space and time which are infinite and then the power extends further you can place upon that timeline and in space any number of events you like any number of events and we place all those events one by one or maybe all together and then we make a nice picture of how we have done it no but we can change it we can make another another set of events 
we can keep on making any number of events, million, trillion, endless, and store them. Uh, you need storage space for so many combinations of possible events to be placed on time and space, and you have to have a storage space. So you use your own mind and create an infinite storage space and put infinite number of events and stack them up. Stack them up so that they are part of the time frame that we have created. You pick up one of those combinations and open it and see there are so many events. How do you link the events one with the other to make it a life like we are leading now? To make it a human life or a life of any life form to make it a life form, we connect the events by a simple principle called cause and effect. In Indian languages called karma. We link these events by cause and effect. One event is a cause, it follows by an event, which is the follow-up of the effect. Cause the one event is cause, one event is effect. One causes karma, other pays off karma. Very simple system, and it's a very beautiful one. So when we take a combination of these things, we store it in a form which can't be described, but I can use a physical analogy for that. We store it on a DVD. That's because we are used to DVDs in which we store. We can play a DVD, the whole show comes up again. So we store it in a DVD and call it our Akashic records, our records from where we can create life. And we store them, and then we decide to pick up one and play it. When we play it, it's wonderful, because we have are playing a combination of events in an infinite life and infinite space. Therefore, the cause and effect goes on infinitely, and goes forward infinitely in time. We step on it, on the timeline, in some form, through the mind, in the form of a concept, in the co and then in the form of an idea, in the form of something that can travel on the timeline. We like to embellish it further, so we create another cover upon this system, in which we are now playing the DVD, and we call it a cover of sense perceptions. That means we divide. We divide what we are perceiving from those events into seeing, hearing, touching separately. Smelling, all senses we separate. It becomes like such a variety and we love it. We love the variety how we can create an event, an experience, which has all these characteristics that we can see it, we can touch it, we can smell it. We, we can like flowers like here, beautiful flowers. We can do all those things, and then we go further. And we experience this thing, which is all happening in a time and space mentally created by us. We solidify it by making it in the form of atoms and, and molecules and other forms of energy to put it together. It looks like it's a physical world. What a beautiful way to do it. And we've done it. This soul of ours is the original self. If you can discover your soul without these coverings, which create these other experiences, you have discovered yourself. If you have discovered yourself, your soul, you will find that the soul is not individual. It's part of a total. The totality of consciousness is in which the soul is participating. It's not participating like it's separated from it. It's particip participating within it. And therefore, you are a participant in your own totality to have an individuated experience. Why? Because in your soul itself, you have certain functions you are performing all the time. One is instant knowing, total knowledge of everything. If you didn't have the total knowledge, you couldn't put it into the mind, you couldn't put it into physical activity or any other activity. The total awareness, the total consciousness of anything possible 
total ability to be conscious of anything is already in your own totality. You're participating in it. Then why are you individualizing yourself in that totality? In order to enhance some of those things that are already there. To enhance the sharing of knowledge. To enhance the sharing of love. To enhance the sharing of the bliss and joy you're experiencing. Now, remember, the soul and totality of consciousness has these things all the time. Love, intuitive knowledge, and bliss, and ultimate happiness. They can't cross beyond that. All these are already part of us in our totality. They are also part of us in the individuated self. In the individuated self, we experience it. The one creates the many within itself so the many can experience what the one has. Love can be experienced. Love is love. Okay, now we want to experience it. We create the many, it becomes an experience. Therefore, within our true home, where we belong, at which we are seek seeking now, for which you come here. You come here for seeking that true home where the totality of consciousness is love. You can call it by any name. You call it God, heaven, ultimate truth, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. But the ultimate totality of consciousness, that is love, total knowledge, intuitive knowledge, not thinking knowledge, not knowledge that requires time, knowledge that requires no time. And the ultimate bliss and happiness and joy that you can ever get. It's all part of that. It continues to be part of the individuated soul. In fact, the individuated soul experiences that which is already total. It's a beautiful way to set it up. And from there, we use the mind and bring these things down with us to the mind. We bring love with us. We bring in intuitive knowledge with us. We bring joy and happiness and bliss with us. Then we use the same things to bring into sense perceptions. We bring the same thing down into our physical forms. Today we are sitting in a physical form as human beings. And as a human being, we have access to these things because we have access to not only the inner self, not only the soul, but totality of consciousness itself. It's amazing. This is the most amazing miracle to have a human body in which you can find all this. There's no greater miracle that I'm aware of. A miracle where you can find totality beyond which nothing exists within one small little human body. And how do you do that? By a gift given to us. A simple gift. I just mentioned to you that if you are able to watch your own mind, listen to your mind and see the picture that it makes, and understand that you are neither the thinking mind nor you are the picture that it makes, that you are the one that can watch it. You are the unit of consciousness, awareness. If you can find that, it's great experience. How do you do it? Putting attention there. So this is another great gift, miraculous gift given to us, the power of putting attention where we like. We can't do anything else where we like. It's attention that follows, attention that makes do other things. You want to read a book, you have to put attention on that. You want to run, you have to put attention on that. You want to do anything in the world, you have to put attention on that. Attention is part of consciousness. It's the available part of consciousness. It is that part of consciousness which you can use the way you want. Not somebody else is controlling it. Everything else is being controlled by something over which you have no control. Where you are born, where you are living, what's happening, what life it is, you have no idea about what's happening. But within this experience, you can put your attention where you like. I just suggested put your attention by closing your eyes behind the eyes. If you try to figure out, where am I putting my attention from? I am sitting in the head and I'm watching my thoughts and just listening to my thoughts. Where am I exactly in this physical body? Is there a location? Or is it just a generalized sensation? You try it out, you will find, no, it's a very specific location. It's right behind the eyes. You can feel that the eyes, physical eyeballs are in front of you. When you close your eyes and want to think, the eyeballs are in front of you. The ears are on either side of you. You're not above or below them. You can pinpoint with a small experience sitting inside that you are sitting in the center of your head. Center of the head. If you were to make 
just to describe geometrically the location. Supposing you make two straight lines from the eyes back to the head, two straight lines, then make a straight line between the two ears. Now you will find that the straight line between the ears will cross the two lines that you have made. That little spot between the two eyes is a little bench on which you are sitting, always. When you are awake, you are always sitting here. It's called that point has been called the third eye center. I get so surprised when people say we are searching for the third eye center while they are sitting on the third eye center. Because you cannot be awake, cannot be in a human body without sitting there. You cannot think without being there. You cannot speak without being there. Then what are you searching for? You are there. You are searching away from yourself. You have something and you are searching for the same thing outside something. Just like the old lady in the Indian village, where there were no lights except the street light. She was searching for something under the street light. And she was looking at the old woman. A young man comes and says, Lady, what, can, what are you looking for? Can I help you to find it? She said, I lost my needle. I was stitching something and my needle dropped, so I'm looking for it. He said, okay, I'll help you. He also started looking. All over the light, he was looking. He said, Madam, do you remember exactly where you dropped it? She said, yes, I dropped it in my house, inside. <laughs> then why are you looking outside? I have no light in the house. We are doing exactly the same thing. We are sitting on the third eye center inside and searching where the third eye center is. How can you be searching for something which you already have? And it's right inside where you are looking for. The mistake we are making is we forget that the third eye center is where we are sitting. Not any space around it. Nowhere else. And we sit there as by searching where the third eye center. The reason being simple. That we are so used to seeing things away from ourselves. We have never tried to see ourselves. There was a saint in India called Fakir Chand. He is a very controversial saint because he made statements like, the saints know nothing. They don't give you anything. They just happen to come into your life as a trigger point for you to find them inside. And then you see those same saints inside and you think they are giving you everything. And he would say, we give nothing. Nobody ever gave anything. You find it within yourself. He said he got initiated by a master who taught him how to meditate and withdraw his attention and go inwards and have great views. He said, I withdrew my attention. I meditated like nobody's business. I thought this was the most important thing in life. And I meditated. And I heard sounds inside, which they said is called the shabd, is called the sound current, the real form of your soul. I heard the sound. I heard, saw lights which I've never seen outside. I saw colors. I heard such sound which they say comes from a true home. I saw everything. And people would think, you got a lot, I got nothing. Because all these things were outside of myself, not me. I did not discover the self. And the real thing was to discover who you are. I never discovered that. I only discovered when people began to tell me that I am appearing in their meditation. And I said, how can they appear in my meditation? I am here, how can they appear? Then I closed my eyes and all those experiences made sense that I am looking at the experience, but not the experiencer. The self is the experiencer, not the experience of any kind whatsoever. Even internal, even the highest experience is only an experience and not the self. When we want to find the truth and go to our true home, we have to find the self, not the experience of the self, no matter where it is. He made a very good point about it. We make the same mistake. We start by making a mistake right from the beginning. Third eye center, we have to sit somewhere and locate it. People sometimes locate their third eye center by imagining that they are sitting in the head in front of them. Little piece, because head is small. So when they meditate, they close their eyes and they see a little picture of themselves. That must be third eye center. No, maybe it can move a little. Don't they realize that whatever you are seeing cannot be you? You are the one who is seeing, not the object you are making. 
this mistake is made so often so frequently by so many meditators in every country i visited that i had to come and tell them something very simple i said when you make a picture of yourself you can never make it inside they but we make it inside i said let's try let's figure it out how it is inside and they give a simple demonstration of how you can find out that these images you make no matter what are always outside the physical body you don't make any image inside of it when you make an image and you see it in front no matter how close it is to you you can do a simple exercise that now with your hands open with your eyes open you can touch your eyes you know where they are if you close your eyes you can still touch them where they are you are conscious of the location of your hands in relation to your eyes you are always conscious of it it doesn't require any effort to touch the eyes whether your eyes are closed or open now close your eyes and see that little self of yours then bring your hands slowly towards your own self and when you bring them when you are not even touch the eyes you will have crossed that image of yours you can try it any time the image is outside not inside just because we have closed our eyes it doesn't come inside who are we looking for not that image we are looking for the one who is looking at the image that's ourselves and we missed that point he was a great saint that who pointed this out though he kept on saying i know nothing he knew the most important thing that we have to search the self not search what the self is experiencing and that is why we sometimes go wrong in our entire spiritual experience because we get fascinated by some internal experiences without ever having known who is having the experience which is the self the discovery of your own self is a secret to discovering the totality of the self because the self is not separate from totality it's just an experience within the totality to see what actual love as an experience can be what knowledge as experience can be what joy and bliss as an experience can be we have integrated within the total so all these things i am sharing with you are accessible to you through simple processes now let me tell you the simple processes by the way what i described now has been called the physical plane the physical body and the physical experience we are having is called the physical plane of experience physical plane of consciousness what whatever the physical level of consciousness because everything here is consisting of atoms and molecules and so on it's made up of physical stuff even the energy used to make them is physical so this is all physical stuff when we close our eyes imagine physical things they're still physical things though imagination is slightly different it's not physical it's imaginary and i'll talk about imaginary in a little while in a little while this is the physical world if you don't have a physical body it does not exist now that may look very strange if you don't have a physical self the physical body does not come into form it comes physical experience starts when you have a physical body over your consciousness if you have a different body which is not physical you have a different experience the second stage when you are not in the physical body like before you are born the physical body or after you die either you are nothing some people believe that the physical body is the only reality which creates so many difficult problems for those who say the physical life is the only reality we were never here before not later this physical life we were born when it becomes very difficult for a mental self which judges things to judge why there should have been such a great discrimination in the form in which different physical beings have been created poor people sick people deformities at birth and people who are rich and enjoying their good health till the end why could they be how could they be what principle is operating to create a physical system if it's all physical what system is operating to create so much discrimination and differentiation between human beings or between all forms of life if there is life in them the problem arises that you cannot explain these things and therefore we have all come up with at least a belief that there is something existing prior to our physical life and that our own life form the 
part of life that comes into life form is not the body, not the physical form, but something else that comes into it, becomes life, and then goes out when we die. And there is something else. Such an extent that people are even saying, when a body dies, there was experiment done about 30, 40 years ago, when a body dies, does it lose weight? Did they come, came, up, uh, came up some conclusions by weighing in a vacuum bodies of different forms that the form loses one tenth, one fourth of its ounce. They said that's the form of the soul. The soul is leaving, that must be the weight of the soul. Of course, according to my understanding, the soul has no weight at all. It's not a physical thing. Weight means physical thing. But this physical self creates a physical being, physical body, and a physical experience all around us. And while we are in the physical body, this is the only reality for us. You must remember this. While we are in the physical body, the physical world, our physical self, is the only reality. Nothing else is real. I can keep on talking about heavens and so on. They are imaginary for me while I'm sitting in the physical body. I have not seen them. We don't experience them. If you experience them here, this will become heaven here. It is still physical heaven. Only when we are not in a physical body can we experience something else. Now, when we are not in a physical body, what happens? We get some evidence from people who describe what they call NDE or near-death experiences. They say that when we died, clinically died, physically died, according to the heartbeat, the brain function became nil, zero. And after that we recovered and told people what happened. Now if we were clinically dead, the physical body was dead, in what form were they experiencing that they could reconnect again with the physical body and come and tell us their stories, write books about it, and of course make a lot of money out of it. Because those books are very popular. That what happened during near death experience. They say that we saw people who had died already. We saw lights and we saw tunnels and we saw the good experiences of what happens at death. And if we were not reconnected, what would be continuously our life? They also mentioned that we were told by somebody, some voice told us, this is not your time and go back into the physical body. So they came back into the physical body. This is just one of the evidences that there is something that exists, but not a very major evidence. Because how can a person be fully dead and come back to life? They must be near death. I understand the word near death. As, as a uh, scientist, uh, with my physics, chemistry, my knowledge of some science, I could say a person is fully dead in the physical body, the physical body nothing but flesh and bones. It can't get anything back. So therefore there is a connection still with them that they can come back into the physical body and tell us stories. But the stories are valuable because obviously they were at such a low level of life in the body that they could come back and tell us stories. That's not a good proof. I have a better proof of this thing. Much better proof. I have a proof that people can simulate death completely. They can simulate the experience of death and experience what it is like if you didn't have a physical body. And this process by which you can create artificially and experience what you would be like if you had no physical body is possible while you are in the physical body. It is possible while you are totally functioning in a physical body without dying. You can have the experience of dying while completely fully living in the physical body. Now that's a great possibility. All of you sitting here can do it. Anybody can do it. It's a very simple process. The means have been given to us already by having a physical body. With the power of consciousness, awareness, by which we are having the experience of everything around us. Finding out that we are experiencing this from behind the eyes, between the ears, at the third eye center, that that's where we are sitting. Withdrawing our attention to that point, attention is given to us. And then, using another facility we have, concentrating our attention. We can concentrate our attention, a very useful thing. If we concentrate our attention, we become more aware of that which we are concentrating on 
and less aware of that which we are not concentrating on. In fact, if you concentrate too much on one thing, you will become oblivious of what is around it. A simple example they give is go to a concert and look at the pipes are playing, the uh, uh, drums are playing and you say, I like the drums, let me concentrate on listening to the drums. As you concentrate on listening to the drum, drums become louder and louder and other instruments cannot be heard. Anybody can try that out. It's the power not only to put attention where you like, but the power to concentrate your attention. Now imagine if you did the same thing to yourself. If you put your attention on where you are, not what you are experiencing. Attention on where am I? What am I doing here? How come these eyes are in front of me? How come I'm making images? How come I'm watching my mind? Where am I doing it from? Who am I? Supposing you sit there and put your attention on that and concentrate on, on this, what will happen? Gradually, you will not know where your hands and feet are. You will not know where your legs and arms are. As you concentrate more, you will not know your whole body where it is. When that happens, something very unique happens. You find that if you don't even know where your body is, then how are you seeing things? You are still seeing things. How are you hearing? How are you having a voice? How can you talk? How can you do these things? And you discover that the ability to use these sense perceptions was not on the body at all. Whether I call it imagination or I call it a different form of uh, myself, I can have an experience by which I can use all my sense perceptions without being aware of the body at all or anything physical. Where have I come? What has happened? I have come to a stage where I discovered that before I had a physical body, I still had that ability. Now, if you stay longer in that state, what happens? You discover you have been in that state for a long time. Like in this body, you can remember some things, not everything. You can remember what breakfast you ate today, but you can't remember what you ate last week. You can remember some things. There you find, I can remember some things, not remember physical things. Remember things where I had the same experience earlier, where I was without a physical body earlier. And then you can recall things that actually happened in your own memory 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. You recall all this and connect it with the physical experiences that happened in a physical body at that time. Where are you operating from? Where is this imagination born? That you can recall for your own self what was happening. Therefore, you have suddenly reached a stage where your sense perceptions, your memory, your mind, and your power of consciousness are all intact completely. That we call it a sensory body or an astral body because it's still a form. The shape of the form is similar to this one. We still feel we have a head, we still feel we have eyes, we still feel we have hands, we can fly because there's no weight on that body. It's so, because there's no physical element in it. When you get that experience, you don't need anybody else's NDE or any other experience to know that you were there before this body was there. And therefore, you will be there when this body is not there. It's a great experience to have it right when you're sitting here in the physical body. This capability to have that experience that what you were before you were born and that you will be there, what you will be after you die, is a very great experience while sitting in a physical body. What happens when you get that experience? The fear of death disappears completely. Because you know you never die. You just, just leave a body which came temporarily to you. And you are still there. You have another body which lasts much longer. And very often people start calling that body the soul. I discovered my soul because it was living before I was born. It will live after that. I found my soul. You didn't find a soul. Soul is still operating through sense perceptions. Soul is still functioning through your mind. Soul is still thinking through the mind. You found one higher self. I call it higher. I don't, don't know if I'm really uh, legitimately calling it higher. Because sometime I can prove you that this is higher than that. But you formed a, formed a form of yours which is not physical. It carries the same, same connection with the self. 
It is the same self that was the physical, not separate. It's not somebody else. It's your own self, the same self that is the physical body, has the same sense perceptions, just they are better. Same memories, much longer than you have here. Therefore, that's a, in a sense, a higher self of yours. We call it the astral self, or in um, Indian language, we call it suksham sharir, because it is so fine. Why they call it the astral? Because it is like the astral uh, experience with a new sky open up, a new world opening up. And it is light. It doesn't have weight. It doesn't have many of the characteristics of the physical body. Therefore, it is still a body, still a kind of body. But that's not all. If this process is so successful, that by putting your attention on the third eye center, on your own self, in this physical body, you can have that experience. What about going further? What about putting your attention on the third eye center of the astral body? People want to wait in the physical body, have experiences to go to astral and higher levels, not realizing that when you are in the astral self, you must now meditate in the astral self, not in the physical body. When they try to go beyond the astral, they come back to the physical. If you want to go beyond the astral, then you must go where you experience the third eye center of the astral self, not the physical self. Don't go back to this bed. This is another common mistake. Even for people who are very serious meditators, they meditate upon the physical body. They become unaware of the physical body. They have those experiences. They realize they are who they are. Then they want to go further and put more attention on the physical third eye center and come back into the physical body. No, then you put your attention only on the center of the head of the astral self. If that happens, you become unaware of your sense perceptions, the same way that you became unaware of your physical senses. And you have such a great experience, you find the creative self of yours, the creator of your own self, that you, how the whole power of creativity was exercised. And even senses were created from that. The physical forms, physical experience were created from that. You have now reached the cause of all things. That's why we call that self the causal self. The causal body, sometimes they call it. And incidentally, you find out that is the mind which you are thinking with. That's the instrument you are using to think here. That's the same instrument you use in the astral plane, the same instrument you're using in the causal plane, and the causal body is nothing but your mind that the mind which you thought was something, just a function of the brain, is actually your own form. When you become unaware of your sense perceptions, unaware of your physical body, is still intact, and you can recall things that happened millions of years ago. Experience that is available to all of us. It is not a theoretical model I'm setting up for you. I'm just telling you what experience you can have. Simple, simple operation, attention in the eye center, in yourself. At every level, you discover everything. Concentrate your attention, which is available from here right to the top, on your own self. You'll have all these experiences. You don't have to call it a religion. Don't have to give it a name. Don't even give it a society or a name of any group. It's not meant for that. Societies are all taking us outside. Religion takes us outside. When you give a name, you're making it a physical thing. If you go inside, there's no name. It's an internal realization of who you are. And at that point, when you discover the whole creative power came from there, you get convinced that you have found yourself, and people call that the ultimate soul they found out. Not the soul. Not yet. It's still your mind. It's the same instrument that the soul is using. Your awareness is using that experience. The awareness, your consciousness is using something to create all these different experiences, whether they are the ultimate causal one, where there are no forms on the, in the form that we see them, either through sensory perceptions or through physical perceptions, no form, even though you have no form, you are the self, but able to think. You are surrounded by a system which can create time, space, and can create these experiences at will, but you haven't created them. And therefore, you are in the causal stage. Yet the self is still the same. That was the physical body. It has not changed. 
is not somebody else you have found. Same self that's thinking today, same self that is talking today, same self is found when you are in the causal self. And then you think, many people have thought that that's the end of the journey. And actually it comes like that. Unless somebody can guide you further, that's the end. Unless somebody can guide you, there is no way to go beyond. Because to go beyond or to go anywhere requires effort. Struggle, doing, all these things require the mind. All these things require the thought. Let me do this. And when thought is not the ultimate, how can you go beyond it? But you can have a causal experience and experience your own mind and relate that to the individuated causal experience, to totality of causal experience, relate your individuated mind to a totality of mind, the universal mind, and then you are sure you have reached your true home. Because then you find that your individuated mind was doing exactly what you have been told. That it is creating everything, it's total, and is participating in the experience of the total. And therefore, our individual mind is not separate from the universal mind, is operating within it. Looks like exactly the description of our ultimate true home. And yet it is not. Because it is awareness, our consciousness that's creating that experience, and we are still inside that experience, inside that mind, not outside, not separate. Can we withdraw inside that self to find who we are? Sorry, no. Because now the withdrawal, which we have done so far, we did with our effort. We put our attention with our effort. We decided to pull our attention with our effort. And the effort came from the mind. And the mind is where we are trying to now work. How can you work with a causal self to find the cause within it? There we stopped. That is why some of the highest realized souls who have talked about it, have described that region so clearly and called it the ultimate true home and taken us to a universal mind and said, this is it. Only very few people, very, very few people when they counted on the fingers of the two hands, exist at any one time. And they exist in larger number now than before on this planet Earth. To meet those seekers, to meet those seekers who want to go beyond that point. All seekers don't want to go beyond that point. Most of the seekers want help from these so-called masters to get some little extra money, better house, something better facilities in the world, cure sickness, heal them, or physical things. Some of them want to have a general experience of heaven. All heavens that we have talked about, all heavens ever described are in the astral plane. Because all heavens are space and time and all heavens of sensory experience. It's easy to understand that heavens cannot be anywhere above the astral plane. No matter how they have been described, they all include space and time. They all include the ability to see and communicate. Therefore, they are all in the astral plane. So many people just want to go to heaven, they go there. They never go further. They never go to a universal mind. They don't even know what the difference between the heaven and the experience of the universal mind is. No idea about it. And here we are talking of something even beyond the causal plane, beyond the mind. I mentioned in the beginning that there are some things which are beyond the mind. That is, consciousness itself has the ability, totality of consciousness itself holds that. Total knowledge, which I call intuitive knowledge, because I didn't want to include knowledge that is thought out, not mental knowledge. Intuitive knowledge that comes suddenly with no thought is already there part of ourself, totality. Bliss, ultimate joy is already part of us. Love is already part of us. These things which are already part of us have trickled down to every level of our experience. They are the ones that can then take us higher, nothing else. Intuitive knowledge, love, pure love can take us there. Now, if the love is at the lower planes of creation, lower planes of experience, between us, they strengthen our bonds here. And very often, this love cannot be distinguished too much from attachment. Even the purest love we have here becomes an attachment. We don't want to get away from here. We get more tied up. It's the same love. It's pure love making more attachment. And we get more caught up here. We can't get out of here. 
because the love is with objects and experiences and people who are a part of this physical universe. Same thing happens at the astral universe. There are such beautiful sights there. Some people are so enamored of those sights when they do meditation and reach that point, they don't want to go any further. They see this is such a beautiful, aesthetic place, so wonderful. And they see heavens. They don't want to go beyond heaven. They get trapped there. They can't go any further. Even pure knowledge, intuitive knowledge we have here. We get a gut feeling. I should be doing this. The mind says no. And we follow the mind and not our intuition. We have the same things here, which we have in our true home. We get a state of bliss one day. And our mind questions, how did it come? What are the cause? And bring it down into cause and effect level. So we are using the same wonderful opportunities. Therefore, to go beyond the mind, beyond the universal mind, we need a love that comes from beyond the mind. We need a pull, we need a kind of bliss, we need a kind of knowledge that pulls us from beyond the mind. And that can only come if we are in the physical body. If there is an experience in the physical sense that's operating from beyond the mind. We create this experience outside here. And have we created an experience outside of ourselves that while we are here in the physical body, we can pull us from somewhere within ourselves to beyond our mind? Yes, we have. We designed it ourselves. If we came to have these experiences, let's put it like that, that we came on a journey, we came out for a vacation. And the vacation turned sour because we forgot it is just a vacation. We thought these ups and downs are real. We thought all this happening around us is real. And so we got caught into the trap and by getting in the trap, we can't get out. We don't know how to get out. We knew this with total knowledge. You would know this before we left our home, true home. If with this intelligence and knowledge we had that we can get so trapped, how could we be so stupid that we didn't make any arrangement to get out when we want to. No, we weren't that stupid. In fact, we were super intelligent. We made the arrangement ourselves. We made full arrangement ourselves. We made the arrangement that when we have had enough of this experience and want to go home, there should be something occurring in that experience itself that should push us back and take us to our true home. This experience that we designed ourselves to go back home when we are tired of this experience, it's messed up ourselves and we don't want any more. That experience is called the appearance in our life in a physical form of another human being whom we call a perfect living master, a son, sub guru. Who is he, that person? He's ordinary person. Then why, how can he perform that role? How can ordinary person created by our own consciousness outside of ourselves perform that role? Because we have assigned that role to him. The reality of that person is our own self inside. We create that person by a pre-designed thing, starting from the initial coming away from our true home, that when we are tired of this thing, our own experience will generate this experience of a person. What's the distinction between that person and ourselves? We are seekers. The person talks of what we, have seen, we are seeking. The person talks not from what he has learned in the physical experience, the person is talking from our true home. He's not talking from what he has heard, what he has learned, what he has experienced before. He's talking from true home when he's here. It's our own self in our true home talking through an experience outside in the physical world. We made this arrangement and we made it now. We made it forever. But we put it in the time frame of our creation at a certain time when we are fed up of this experience or we had enough of it. If you want to know a person is seeker of a true home or not, ask him a simple question. Are you tired of what is going on? He has to say yes. If he says no, he's not ready. His time has not come. One friend of mine came to me. He said, I am enjoying my life. I have been blessed by the Creator, blessed by God, given me a nice house, nice family, nice children lot of money. I want everything one can desire for. I'm living a happy life. Why should I follow what you are saying? 
Why? I don't need any spiritual path or spiritual truth. I said, no, you don't. Go and enjoy. You go, your time is to enjoy and enjoy. I'm giving you good advice. If that is your situation, you don't need this. Obviously, in my heart, I felt that couldn't be a situation. He wouldn't come and ask me. Why has he come to me in the first place, if he's really that happy? Next week, he comes back to me and cries hoarsely at the bad relationships he has had, how much disappointment he's had, how his life is in a mess. How can life become in a mess in one week? No, it was always in a mess. The time had come to come to a true home. He had done with this. He found this was not his place. It came to him. It was not my place. I know I am here temporarily. These insight awarenesses that come, this is not our place. This is not we have done enough and we have to go home. They come at the right time. At that time, that human being who is an ordinary human being, just like us, sometimes more ordinary than us, comes up and talks to us and does something to us which ordinary human beings cannot do. He plants a seed of unconditional pure love in us and he extends that love to us and makes us experience the same love. And we try to shake it off with our mind, with our mind which is used to creating doubt and skepticism. The mind keeps on skepticism and doubt, but the love is so strong, it ultimately keeps on rising, keeps on rising and pulls us. We don't at that time realize where it's coming from. It's coming from beyond the mind. It's pulling us beyond the mind and eventually takes us beyond the mind. I'll have a break now for lunch and I'll see you again about 3.30.